Father God, in the name of Jesus Christ, Lord, we thank you for blessing us and saving us and loving us. And Lord, thank you for assembling us together. Give the praise for... Uh, to, to, thank you, Lord, for giving us this opportunity to offer the praise for lips to you. And Lord, I ask now that you open the eyes and ears and hearts of our understanding that we may receive more of you this day. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. Amen. Okay, today is number six in the series of The Wild Man of Gad, which indicates most of us, as you'll find out if you don't know already, uh, and the swine, and that's how the Lord's phrase all the unsaved people. Okay, it's given them a metaphor for what they are. And so, let's just read this. We'll start off with, I'm going to do a little recap here, of, uh, so we have an idea of what we're talking about. Again, for some of us who are new. The title of this particular section is, Come Out of the Man. We're talking about unclean spirits and devils. We'll be talking about demons and devils today. Mostly, that's the emphasis today, is on demons and devils. And my point is going to be that demons and devils are unclean thoughts sent by Satan. All right, so let's read this now. Mark chapter 5, verses 1 through 13. And they, that is Jesus and his disciples, were in a ship, and they came over to the other side of the sea, of the Sea of Galilee, <clears throat> into the country of the Gardenes, the land of Gad. Gardenes means the people living there. And when Jesus was come out of the ship, <clears throat> immediately there met him out of the tombs, that's a cemetery now, a man with an unclean spirit. We know that unclean spirits are fallen angels, they're demons. A man with an unclean spirit who had his dwelling among the tombs, and no man could bind him, that's the man to himself, no other man could bind him, he was a wild man, and no other man could bind him, no, not with chains, because that he had been often bound with fetters and chains. Fetters are the, the foot chains right, and, ch and chains. And what happened? And the chains had been plucked asunder by him, just plucked asunder like that. And the fetters broken in pieces, supernatural power. Actually, uh, not as supernatural as you might think, but in any case, because he had often been bound with fetters and chains, the people around him had tried to tie him up because he was a wild man. I'll give a description here. This guy was naked. He had his, a beard uh, almost all over it, way, way, way down, longer than any of you guys have right now, okay? And he's, he hasn't shaved in years. And he's, and he's walking around ranting and raving and ranting and raving and ranting and raving and yelling and shouting, okay? And uh, the people were trying to calm him down because he looked dangerous. Well, actually, he was crazy. He was dangerous, apparently so. All right, and he was running around this, this, over, and so on, so on. That's what the, this guy, wild man, now. Now, what we look at here is a ultimate picture, an ideal picture. What God is producing, for, produced here for us, is <clears throat> a picture of an unsaved man, the ultimate unsaved man. I mean, we all have problems, and we all are a little bit strange and a little bit weird sometimes, and whatever. Okay, but this guy was—he was gone. He was way out of it. All right. He was the ultimate unsaved guy. And the unsaved guy walks around naked. Well, how come he's walking around naked? Because he's, he's not domesticated. He's not tamed. He's, he's not civilized. He's not cultured, okay? All right? He's walking around naked and doing this and that and yelling and shouting and screaming because he, that's, what, <laughs> that's what unsaved people do. <laughs> Look at the world around you. What's happening out to us? Everybody yelling, yelling and shouting and screaming. All right. So this man had his dwelling. And this guy lived in the tombs. In the cemetery, okay, we wind up finding out that the cemetery, the tombs, are actually a symbol of the bad things that happened to him in his past, or the th bad things he'd done in his past, his thoughts, his memories. That's just, that's where you you all, every one of us has a cemetery in our mind, of the things that we've done in our past. Now some things are good. We've got them now in in uh, uh, Israel. The, the cemeteries were lots of more mountainsides, so they had caves, not holes as much as caves. And so you, you buried, you're dead in the caves. Um, 
So this guy was living in the caves, in, in the tombs of his mind. And all these bad things that he'd done in the past, and all these, it was just, ah, you're driving him crazy. You know, just sort of like what happens to a lot of us. When the things get too much for us, we get kind of overwhelmed, and then we just go a little crazy sometimes, all right? We all do that. You know, I'm going to tell you something. I was a, I'm a student of psychology. I have a degree in psychology. We're all crazy. Don't let anybody kid you. We're all crazy, okay? It's just that how much? That's all. How much? All right? So if you're just kind of like normally crazy, like, like a lot of us are, then you, know, you don't pay attention because, oh, that's just the way it is, you say, okay? But then there's some weirdos that go out there and get a little weirder and a little weirder. Then those are the ones we pay attention to. Then, oh, that guy's crazy. Yeah, yeah, but so are we, see? We're just not quite as crazy as he is. But what God has shown us, this picture of a wild man is the craziest. He's the ultimate picture of all of us. Okay, this is what some of us could be in the end, okay? All right. And so he was living in his, uh, what was driving him crazy was all the things he'd done, the things, the experiences he'd had in the past, things he'd done to people, things that people had done to him. All those things were, were little tombs and it's like a memory. A memory is, uh, is stored away in a tomb, shut off now, okay? All right. Well, he was going back and living in those tombs. He was, and every time you go back to one of those bad memories in your mind, you're going back to the tomb, and you're opening up the tomb again, and you're walking in. And what do you have, what do you do when you walk in? You re-experience the memory again, don't you? See, that's what he was doing. But he was re-experiencing lots and lots of bad stuff. Okay, so it was ah, that's that. Where was that? And again, the point is, we do it a little bit. Some more than others live back in the, back in the bad memories of our mind. He was doing it all the time. <laughs> I, I, in, my, in my cemetery, I have a lot of bad things all tucked away back in there. I don't like visiting them because they make me depressed when I do, okay? But then I have some lots of good things that I have tucked away too, past experiences that I had, like when I was walking in the, in the, in the, in the water in the, in the, in the, in the creeks and, uh, when I was a kid and walking through the forest and, and uh, uh, just uh, kind of outside things, a lot of good, good thoughts. And what I try to do is I try, try to go back and think about the good things. Because if you go back and think about the bad things, it's going to drive you crazy. How come? Because you can't do nothing about it. It's a done deal. No matter how much you think about, how much you cry and whine and, and, and get angry and everything else about your memories in the past, you can't do a thing about them. They're there forever. Now the promise is this. When we die, God wipes away all that bad stuff. All wiped away. And we're cleansed. We'll never remember it again. Now, I'll give you a, 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 an example, right? A close example. We, lots of us have uh, uh, brothers and sisters, okay? If your sister, if you're saved and going to heaven, and the rest of your, your family is saved and going to heaven, but there's one sister or one brother who's not saved, okay? You're going to be in heaven. Now, think about this. You're going to be in heaven, a place of joy and ultimate happiness, right? But there's going to be one of your relative, your sister, your brother, who's in hell, going through a lot of pain and agony, agony, agony and torment. Now, let me ask you a question. How are you going to think about that? That's not going to make you happy at all, is it? Well, wait a minute now. Heaven is a place of happiness and joy, right? Oh, a serene happiness and joy. How can you be happy and joy when you know you've got a relative, a loved one, in, uh, in hell going through lots of pain and torment? You can't be happy. So what God is doing is this. He's erasing those thoughts from your mind. When you get to heaven, that sister or brother won't exist anymore. To you. To you, that sister or brother won't exist. Erased from your mind. Covered up. Covered up. Why? Because if you had it in your mind, you'd be in, uh, in torments in heaven. You can't be in torments in heaven. You've got to be in joy. God wants you to have joy. So the unsaved are erased from your mind like you never had them in the first place. See that? God's taking care of you. God's taking care of you. So, now we talk about this guy here, this wild man, because he'd often been bound with fetters and chains, and the chains had been plucked asunder by him, and the fetters broken in pieces, neither could any man tame him. And that's the deal. Neither could any man tame him. A man couldn't tame him, but we're going to see that Jesus Christ could. 
See, we're all we're all wild animals. We're, we're created on the sixth day, the same as animals. Even the Ecclesiastes uh, says in that that we're beasts. We're, we're we're animals. Okay, but some of us get tamed, and it's like like having a pack. I used to have a horse horse stable uh, years ago up in Tennessee. I had like uh, I don't had a lot of horses there. I had uh, 19 of my own, and then I boarded out horses and other things and whatever. But anyway, and the horses would run around. Those horses were all initially before before they were ever caught. They were wild. All right, let's look like that. Let's see how let's see they came from out west. Just for example, where there are lots of wild horses still. So they were wild. They're wild. They're wild. They're wild. And what we did, we brought the horses in and we tamed them. How do we? Ta what do you mean tame them? We got them so that. They didn't run around and bite people and kick and shout and, and knee and, and do this and that and all those bad little kinds of things all the time and hurt people and hurt each other, all right? They just were nice and quiet. They were in their stalls and they ate their food and they relaxed and had their nice hay and straw and they had this and that. And so, But how do we tame these animals? We tamed them with love. We tamed them with love. That's it. That's, God is love. But we tamed them with love. Now, I... Well, I wasn't saved at the time. I didn't. I was. I don't think I was. I'm hard telling about me anyway. Anyway, uh, what? But we 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 give them the best of everything. I got. I got. I would buy horses at the auction, and uh, and uh, kicking and yelling. He got. I had old one uh, with scars all over his body. Had scars all over. He was fighting all the time. Everybody, and he was. We called him Hurricane. Okay, got him. Got him into. Uh, I got him into the stall and started being nice to him. I mean, really nice. Started feeding them the best of the oats and the best of the hay and the best bedding and clean his stall and give this and that and the best water and the best this. Oh, you're a nice horse. And talking to him, nice horse. Hey, you're a good, hey, good. Hey, you're a good horse. Yeah, you're a good horse. Nice horse. Nice horse. You got, oh, you're fine. It's like God's talking to us. We treated that horse. We kept loving that horse. And you know, he turned out to be a great horse. He come right out of it, just like that. He'd never been exposed to anything like that before. He'd always been beaten and pushed around and shoved and this, that, and whatever by other people and other horses. He'd never been exposed to love before. Now, I didn't know that I was loving that horse. But I know now the definition of what I was doing is loving that horse. Well, that's what we're all doing. We're all wild critters first. We all come, we're all wild. We're like this wild man, okay? And then God corrals us. He brings us in, he, tame, he starts taming us. T t taming us so that we can... Look, I want to ask you this. You think there are any wild critters in heaven? No. <laughs> there ain't, no ain't no wild men women in heaven. There ain't no wild critters in heaven. Ain't none. They're all obedient. They're all socialized. They're all tame. They're all nice. They're all loving. That's the point of it all. Okay? All right? That's what God wants you to be. That's what's become of you. You were a wild critter at one time. You maybe still are if you're not saved. A wild critter. And Lord God wants to bring you into his family. And he wants to calm you down and treat you good and treat you lovingly and take care of you. And you'll respond to him. And what will you do? Now, when I got that hurricane, first hurricane, in, in, uh, in, in, we couldn't hardly ride the horse. It was so crazy, okay? But we kept working and working and working with him. And we kept training him. And he won't, and he refused at first. He refused at first, and then, uh, and then he started loosening up, loosening up a little bit, and we started training. And he became a good riding horse. I put him out on the on the on the, on the uh, what did I call it? Uh, with a bunch of other horses I had. There were we had a riding stable too. They could come in and ride horses too. And I put him out. Well, people ride him. I mean, here they were riding this. What was what we, what we purchased was it was a wild animal almost, but we calmed him down because we loved him. All right, and he, he finally broke out and realized that we loved him. Let me tell you the story about Jimmy. <laughs> Jimmy was a pinnacle horse, a painted horse, you know, a painted horse. Uh, they're uh, not really quite as big usually as a regular size horse, but uh, they're pretty good size. Maybe they have a back about, about to here, okay? Here's the back and head up here. That was Jimmy. When, when Jimmy came, came to our, our stable, I bought him an auction, of course, too, right? When, when he came to our stable, I... Uh, uh, he, he just acted like he didn't know anything. I mean, he acted like he was a, just a dumb guy, you know? Like, you couldn't tell him anything, whatever. But we kept working, working with him, working him. 
And here's what, and he was dumb, and, and we couldn't even put him on, on, the, on the trail riders because he was afraid he didn't know what he was going to do next because he didn't know anything. So one day, I was in with Jimmy in the stall. And I got in, and I started to pet him. And I pet him about this high. Petting him, hey, Jimmy. I started talking to him, hey, Jimmy, nice Jimmy. Started to curry him. That's taking a little kind of a comb and curing out his fur and everything, and, and hair, I should say. Uh, and I was just being nice to him, nice Jimmy. And I was talking, oh, he's a nice horse. And I just cause wasn't paying much attention anymore. I just kept petting him and talking to him. And because I was trying to calm him, get him clean, curing is when we get him clean. And all of a sudden I felt this something nudging my back. And I looked around. And there was Jimmy. He turned his head around. His head was over here. He turned his head around and had his head, his actual head, his face, right up against my butt. And he was, and I thought he was going to bite me, but I couldn't move because he was, he had me trapped. And he was, and he pushed me. And what he was doing, he was pushing me into him. So he was standing here and he turned his head around like this and with his whole head and pushed me and just held me, pushed me right into him, closer into him, and just held me there. And I kept on betting them because I wasn't going to do anything else. Because <laughs> they got big teeth, you know. Right? And I was just petting him. And he kept holding me, holding me, holding me. I was talking to him. Then after about maybe 10, 15 seconds, he, he let me go. He's back up. And I, and I started to think, what did he do there? He didn't hurt me. He didn't bite me. He just pushed me into him. And I kept petting him. And then he turned around and he did it again. He'd come back and push me back up into him again. And you know what? We rode that horse the next day. He knew all the gates. He knew all, it was, at five gates, he knew all the gates. He knew, he knew how to walk, I mean, all, he'd, been, he'd been wonderfully trained. Wonderfully trained. He was just a perfect horse. And he was perfect and uh, calm and comfortable and a wonderful ride. All, all was for, uh, after that. Isn't that something? Yeah. See, the point is, I was loving him. Even if I was a little afraid of him, I was loving him at the same time. And then he, with all the good food we were giving these guys, and with all the, all the nourishment, and all the good hay, and, and cleaning their stalls all the time, and talking to them and this, that, whatever, it was nice to them, he started to love me. He started to return my love. That's what you do with a wild animal, you know. He had a wild dog. There's my dog in the back there that looked at me. <laughs> our, our mission dog, I should say. Oh, well, Sparrows. You know Sparrows, right? right. Well, I did that. He looked up. At me. <laughs> when you get a wild dog, boy, <laughs> snapping, his, snapping the snarl, that's your source one. Well, you get him into the, in your house, and you just kind of try and calm him down. And you don't, you don't, don't hit him, because then you got problems then. But you just got to calm down, and you keep working with him. And, and working with him, working with him, and putting, some, sliding some food toward him, and, and doing this and that, whatever. And maybe after a, two, three days, or a week, <clears throat> or two weeks, he kind of quiets down, quiets down, and he just goes, Arr, every time he comes near him, he starts wagging his tail, like this. And you bring a little bucket of food, and you put it in front of him, and he takes it. All right. I mean, he, and he doesn't bite at you, because you love the dog. And he responded. Wild things respond to love. We're all wild critters. Every one of us is a wild critter. Until we receive Jesus, the love of Jesus, God is love. What's that make Jesus Christ? That he's love as well. Until we receive Jesus, he starts loving us, and we start calming down. We start calming down. We start conforming to, a, to the Bible. We start conforming to the ways God wants us to be. We start to become obedient. That's the word, obedient. Because before that, when we're wild, we're not obedient at all. We're just wild. You know, I'm not going to do that. But we start, we learn to be obedient. And obedience is love. That's the whole deal. That's what it's all about. That's what you're here today for, to be trained up in the way you should go. What's the way, that's proper, what's the, what's the way you should go? Love. To be trained to love. How do you learn to love? Well, you know, when you get married to someone, okay, you don't, you don't just, uh, 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 well, I say, meet someone and your personalities are like this and then you get married and, all right, 
But what happens is, you know them pretty good a little bit. You, you've done a little bit of merging because we have, you have some things in common. And then the more you mo know them, the more you love them. The more intimate you become with them, the more it works two ways, you see. You love them, they love you back. You become more and more intimate, and then you have a bonding. You're, in, you're actually two people who are in love because you've been bound to each other. You're not two wild critters anymore. You, you've bound yourself, but you can't, you see, two wild animals, they can't, they can't bind. They can't bind in love. You need Jesus to be there, to be to supply the love. And then you get this kind of a relationship. And that's the kind of relationship I had with my animals, with most of the animals I've ever had. I've always loved my animals, okay? I still do my cat. The only thing I got, I just walk around and my, and this dog is, that's everybody's dog, it's our mission dog. <clears throat> that dog's been with us for three, over three years now. He's a bulldog. He's a mean, nasty looking dog. I mean, he is a mean, I mean, when you can first see him, he's like, right, if he uh, shows his teeth, but he's all, he never bit anybody his entire life. All these things, people coming and going here, hundreds and hundreds of people every day. Uh, and he, now if you're on a bicycle, he'll chase you, but he chases the wheels, but he won't bite you, okay? <laughs> yeah, he's, 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 a, he's just a, a loving dog, and he's actually listening to us now, kind of, almost, in, that, in, in a way. <laughs> and I like having him around. Yeah, look at Okay? God. All right, now where were we like? I'm lost on that, okay? All right, <laughs> We had this guy who was in the tombs uh, and no man, uh, every day, and, and he lived there, and no man could tame him. And always night and day he was in the mountains and in the tombs, in the hard places. At stone, hard places, crying and cutting himself with stones. Well, why, why was he crying and cutting himself with stones? He was crying and cutting himself with stones because he knew he had demons and devils in him. All right, and he didn't, but he couldn't. Get, he's trying to get them out. He's trying to get them out. He's, he's cutting them, crying. Oh, I need help. Oh, that's terrible. Ah, I'm wild. And he tried, and he's cutting himself with stones. I don't know. Some of us might, might be doing that uh, in, in effect. Maybe not with stones, but you might be uh, doing other things, uh, trying to get some of those nasty critters out of, your, out of your mind because those are your thoughts. You see, it works out like this. We get, we get, we get ultimately, we get thoughts from two sources. God sends, sends thoughts to us. He sends thoughts to us in the form of angels. Those are called messengers. Uh, in the Hebrew Malach, okay? So he sends his messengers to us, okay? And, and, and angelic thought. Now he sent... He sent some independent messengers to, to us in the Bible for explanation. We sent a whole bunch of messengers here. Because thoughts are angels. What am I holding up in my hand? I'm holding up the Bible, the Word of God. That's God's thoughts. These are God's thoughts. Well, if they're God's thoughts and thoughts are angels, then what's the deal here? These are, and in fact, it even says something in, uh, uh, um, in the Bible about, uh, and I'm, I'm trying to remember the exact place now, where the angels are responsible for uh, uh, the t uh, providing the Ten Commandments, or uh, I've forgotten how it all goes now. I'll have to look it up. But I said two sources. So we have God's thoughts coming at us, and then we have Satan's thoughts coming at us. Now Satan, now God's using things in the world to talk to us. Satan does that too. He uses the television and he uses newspapers. And he uses, uses other people. They say bad things to us. Uh, the whole thing, all these nasty thoughts come out of it. I mean, if, if you watch television for any length of time, uh, it's going to drive you, drive you a little <laughs> it's crazy. It's because it's all... Television is, is bad, a lot of bad thoughts, almost all bad thoughts coming at you. Where do they come from? Well, uh, Satan, the Bible says that Satan is a god of this world. He's also the prince of the air. Okay, well, television comes through the air. Prince of the air. Okay. So what we're doing is we're receiving a lot of garbage all the time. But that's warfare. Because God has got you here, here today to receive a lot of good stuff. Now, in effect, what's really happening, although it's hard to imagine like that, the words of God that I've been reading to you, those are angels going into your head. 
Those are God's thoughts going into your head, okay? God's thoughts now, okay? And when you get out of here and you go back home, you have a whole bunch of bad angels all around you all the time. As soon as you turn on the television or radio or pick up a newspaper or something, you see a lot of bad stuff, okay? You get it from two ways. All right, now let's, uh, I got a little off on that. It's just a wonderful thing. Understanding this God is a wonderful thing because you're going to come out of this body just like me. I'm going to come out of this body. This body's going to just drop off someday, go, go to rot or whatever happens to it. And I'm going to be, and the me that's talking to you, the, the fellow inside, okay, this being that's talking to you is going to live forever and ever and ever. You're going to live forever and ever and ever. I don't care about you. Some of you are driving Chevys and Fords and Cadillacs and pickups and whatever in terms of your body. Now, they're all kind of different vehicles, okay? You got a Plymouth over here and a Chevy there, but you know, those are just vehicles to, to get us where we want to go. We're, we're in the side, this vehicle was my body, this vehicle, and I steer it where I want to go. I went over here, it goes here, it goes there, it's just like a car. Praise God. Where are you going to go when you die? When you come out of this body, where are you going to go? You see, because we're children now. God calls us children in the Bible. Why does he call us children? Well, because we're not really an adult until we die. That's when we, that's when we actually turn into being what we actually are. Okay? Forever and ever and ever, eternally, we're going to become that, whatever that, that spirit, that type of spirit is, forever and ever and ever. Until then, we're growing. Now, some of us are growing wheat. And we're wheat. That's a good, good stuff that God's planted. And other of us are tares, growing tares, which are bad, poisonous seeds, not saved, not born again seeds, which Satan planted. Well, and he was in the mountains, in the tombs, crying and cutting himself with stones. But when he saw Jesus afar off, he ran and worshipped him. Oh, there it is. There it is. The guy is going crazy. He's running around. He's naked. He's this, that. Nobody can control him. He can break the bus of stones and this, whatever. He's living in the tombs. Oh, he's going crazy. And he's cutting himself with stones all the time. Oh, I'm just... Because he's been driving. He thinks it's happening to him from the inside. He knows there's something going on inside. Shouldn't be there. You know there's something inside of you. Shouldn't be there. He knows it too, and he's chopping it. And then one day, Jesus came across the Sea of Galilee, and he came to the shore, and this wild man looked out and he saw him. And what's the say he did to them, to him? But when he saw Jesus afar so off, that is coming into shore, he ran and worshipped him. He ran and worshipped him. This wild guy, this wild man. This, uh, nobody can control him. How come? He knew Jesus was a way out. The Bible says, there's no temptation taking that is taken as common to every man. But God has provided a way of escape. But in this case, God has provided a way of escape for you. A way to escape your temptation, your testing, your trial. The bad thing is going on. God's provided a way to escape. That's what this guy did. He did it in real life. He saw Jesus coming and he ran and worshipped him. And worshipped him on top of it. That's Receiving Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. He ran and worshipped him. That was his way to escape. That's our way to escape. That's why this, so I'm going here, this is the sixth message on this, this particular story. Why? Because it's so very important to each and every one of us. That's why I'm kind of reviewing this, because it's important to know what's going on. We each and every one of us have a way to escape. All these things are going on around us. Now, why are these things happening? All these bad things are happening because why? I'll tell you why. Because God's allowing them to happen to you. God's using those bad things to train you up in the way you should go. Okay? God's using those bad things so that you can overcome them and become, and this is what God wants you to become. And overcomer. If you look at the book of Revelations and read that, it talks all about the overcomers. They get this and they get this and they get this and this and so on and so on. 
God wants you to be an overcomer. Now let me let me say this. If you've never had any bad thing happen to you in your entire life, so you've never really had any obstacle, how strong of a person could you be? Not uh, Nothing. See, the principle is this. In Exodus chapter 1, Pharaoh uh, looked, looked at the children of Israel. There was a new Pharaoh. He looked at the children of Israel and said, there's way too many of these Israelites here. Uh, there's way too many. So he decided to try and get rid of them by giving them hard tasks and hard duty and hard things to do. And hard and hard and hard things to do, making straw without bricks and things like that. But the Bible says, but the more he afflicted them, the more they multiplied and grew. The more he afflicted them. See that? It's the affliction against you that causes you to multiply and grow. It's just like working out with weights. If you work out with weights, you're afflicting your muscles. What's happening to your muscles? They're not leaving you and going away. They're getting bigger and stronger. That's what God's doing with you. Now, if you've never had any affliction or persecution in your life, you've had never any problems, you ain't hardly nothing. You're just kind of like a little pansy kind of a person. But I got some real tough guys here and ladies because you people have been through some stuff. You've been through some stuff. And you know what? You overcome. You overcome. That's the thing God wants you to become and overcome. He wants you to overcome those adversities, those problem areas, those things that are not right in your life not happy, making you happy, he wants you to overcome them. God wants that. Why? Because it makes you stronger. Because he's, you're served. God's got an army. You all listed in the army of God when you said, ask Jesus Christ to be your Lord and Savior. Every single one of you said that. That's what happens in the military. How many people have been in the military? Raise your hand. My hand's up. I want to see. All right. Okay. In the military, you're a recruit. They get you up. You're in your civilian clothes and everything. They line you up in line and say, see these, say these words. Raise your hand and say these words. <laughs> ah, wow. Well, that's... <laughs> anyway, and, and that's what you do. You raise your hand and you say words and you, 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 uh, you say that you're going to su support the United States of America and so on and so on. What do you do when you get saved? When you get born again? You, stand, you raise your hand, you stand up, and you say words. You join God's army. Every one of you here is a soldier in God's army, a warrior in God's army. 2 Timothy talks about that. You're a warrior in God's army. And God wants you to be strong. He doesn't want who, whoever, you know, one per, worst person in the world, one person in the world who wants weak warriors. You ever see anybody like that? Well, give me some weak warriors. Give me, oh, that's not weak enough. Give me some really weak. You want, when you've got a warrior, you're putting an army together, you want strong warriors, right? Well, how do you get strong warriors? Bang! The more he afflicted them, the more they multiplied and grew. I'll tell you what, some of the strongest warmers are got, warriors that we got are guys who've been in jail. Those guys learned a lesson if they got saved afterwards. Okay? They learned a lesson. See, they got some real affliction. How come they went to jail? I, had, I used to preach up at the jail. I preached up at jail for 10 years. I thought you should tell the guys, how come you guys are in jail? Why, why do you think you're in jail? Well, it isn't because, well, this said that, and he said that, and I'm, I'm, I shouldn't be here because I don't belong to this. Hey. God's in control. God's in control. You're in jail because God wanted you to be in jail. Period. That's the deal. God's in control. Okay. So why would God want you in jail? Well, he wanted you in jail because you weren't listening. You weren't listening to what, was, what God wants. He wants you to obey the laws of the land. You weren't listening. And he said, go to for a judge and let you off. Okay, first time. Second time you go for a judge. Well, listen, what's that? He puts you on probation then. Third time, you do say, bang, jail time. How come? Because you weren't listening. Now, when you go to jail, you got lots of time to listen. That's what you do. If you're smart, you go to study the Bible, you listen, you come on that thing, a changed man. The recidivism rate for, it gets all over the place. Everybody's got a different number. But it's somewhere in excess of 84%. 84% of the people who go to jail one time go back again. It's called recidivism, they return. The recidivism rate, recidivism rate for people who go to jail and get saved and born again is like 3% <laughs> as compared to an 80-some percent deal. 
3% as compared to an 80% yield. How come? Because you learned your lesson, and now you go back out, and you're a different person. I mean, hey, let's, let's get real. Who do you think created these laws in the first place? They're all based on the Ten Commandments. It's God's law. Who do you think allows these crazy and sometimes stupid and wicked uh, 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 senators and uh, congressmen and so forth and so on to get office? God does. God appoints them. How come? So they can afflict you. Really? <laughs> yeah, they're doing it. They're banging you up. <laughs> okay. All right. Okay. But when he saw Jesus afar off, he ran and worshipped him. That's uh, Mark after 5, verse 6. 5, verse 6. You see the verse there. But when he saw Jesus afar off, he ran and worshipped him and cried with a loud voice and said, What have I to do with thee, Jesus, thou Son of God, the Most High God? That would be the man saying that, okay? Uh, acknowledging Jesus to be the, uh, uh, the Son of God. And then uh, he said, I adjure thee by God that thou torment me a lot. That's the, that's the legion, we call him. That's what we find out what his name is, legion. That's the unclean spirits in him who spoke out. See, demons speak through you too. Let me, ask you, let me give you an example of, of, of demonic possession, okay? Now, there's no such thing as any person being totally possessed. We're going to talk about that later on. That's coming too. But there's no such thing as a person being totally possessed. Because the Bible says God's given everybody a way to escape. Okay? And that's what this guy had. He had 6,000 demons in him. That's what we later uh, tell in the story. He had 6,000 demons in him. But God gave uh, 6,000 demons, unclean thoughts. But God gave him a way to escape. He ran to him. All right? That was the way to escape. And my point of that was nobody is totally possessed. Now, I used to smoke cigarettes. I used to smoke cigarettes. <laughs> and I, that's my, and then I, another one. I was in one pack, sometimes two packs, a uh, pack and a half a day or so, just smoking cigarettes. And I used to say uh, later on, <clears throat> first when I started smoking cigarettes was because I wanted to be a big kid. I was uh, uh, 15 years old and I wanted to be a big shot, like the other big shots who smoke cigarettes too. Uh, so anyway. When I finally figured it out, when I it was, it was in my 40s or so, in my, I, I wanted to quit smoking cigarettes. I went, but, you know, I shouldn't say that. I kept smoking. Here's what it was doing. I was smoking a cigarette, and then I say, I hate this thing. I look at it. It's terrible. It's even, it doesn't taste good. <laughs> and then I light another one. <laughs> Wait a minute. I, if I walk around not thinking so badly about something that I even tell other people that I hate, hate this thing and, 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 and it stinks and, and it's killing me. I'm saying, tell people it's killing me. And then I say, I'll light another one. <laughs> you know, well, what's going on? Who was in control? I'm not, I wasn't in control of that, that me. In that, in that area, I was not in control. Well, somebody had to be in control, because if I hated doing it and didn't want to do it, and I kept on lighting a cigarette, something's going on there, someplace. Well, who else have I got? I got fallen angels. I got demons. I got unclean thoughts in my head who had me locked in, had me, ah, gotcha. Wouldn't let go. And I wanted to get rid of them. I didn't know how. I tried, tried, tried. Couldn't do it, couldn't break it. Finally, Jesus broke it for me. But there's, my point is, that's a way to escape, you see. And I'm, in, I'm, not, I'm not kidding you. I would actually do that. I would say, these are really terrible, stinky things. I don't know why anybody smoked. They kill you. They can kill me. I was caught in a coughing <laughs> almost all the time. I was, <laughs> you know, <laughs> this is really great. You know, it was a terrible thing. And I, and like, I like another one. Hey, right another one. Look at what, what kind of sense does that make? That's like drugs, folks, ladies and gentlemen. It was a drug. Okay, because it, ah, demonic stronghold. You can't quit your, your crack, your cocaine, your, your heroin, uh, uh, any, you can't, your, your pills, you can't quit them on your own and just say, oh, I, I just don't want to do them anymore. I'm not going to happen. Those are fallen angels. 
Those are, are a, a conglomerate, a, a group, it's called a stronghold in the Bible, of fallen angels in your mind that are controlling you. That's of similar thoughts. One, one, one angel thinks, this, in other words, pretty soon you got 50,000, 100,000. This guy, well, this guy, not that many, but well, who knows? But you got hundreds and hundreds of uh, fallen angels saying the same thing to you. It's pretty convincing. Okay, they got you. You can't break that. You, you cannot, the Bible says in the Bible that we're supposed to stand and resist the devil. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. It never says we're supposed to attack the devil. Not ever, ever, ever does it say that. Yet. Because we don't have the full mind of Christ yet. We're going to have the full mind of Christ. And when we get that, then we're going to attack. Right now we're supposed to resist the devil. Okay? Well, you can't resist fallen angels. But Jesus can. The Holy Spirit can. His Spirit can. His Spirit does. You ask that Jesus Christ to come into your life. The Holy Spirit comes with him. He is the one who will take care of those afflictions that you have. Those, those uh, uh, addictions. All to Jesus. Continuing. So, uh, uh, so Jesus had said unto him, uh, this is the wild man now, he said, and who's he talking? He said unto the wild man, come out of the man. Who's he talking to? He didn't talk to the wild man. He says, come out of the man. Come out of the wild man. Well, who else is he talking to? He's talking to the demons. He's talking to the devils. He's talking to the fallen angels. He said, come out of the man. The unclean spirit. Now, look at down here at the first footnote, what unclean means. It means, in the Greek, it means impure, ceremonially or morally lewd, specifically demonic, foul. Okay? Second, unclean spirit. Number two, spirit is an angel. It could be a demon. It could be God. It could be Christ. It could be the Holy Spirit. It could be life. It could be the mind. The mind. Where do these things live? In your mind. That's where they live. These bad, unclean thoughts, these fallen angels live in your mind. You have to, if, in order to, listen, in order to go into battle, in order to, to, to defeat your enemy, you have to know what your enemy is and who he is, right? If you don't, if you, if you don't know who your enemy is, who are you going to fight? You've got nobody to fight because you don't know. That's what Obama did for eight years with us on, on uh, uh, Al-Qaeda and uh, uh, calling them uh, Islamic terrorists. Yeah, we couldn't do that. He didn't want us to identify who we were fighting, and we didn't. <laughs> now we're identifying it. Okay, unclean spirit, uh, 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 okay, let's look at the third footnote, a devil, devils, in the Greek, uh, it's a, a, to distribute for, fortunes, a demon or supernatural spirit of a bad nature, a devil. Now I showed this last week and I'll do it again today. We're talking about a devil, right? Evil. D. Evil. No. Evil. In the Bible, evil is the same word as bad, B A D. We have good and bad, but we don't ever say good and evil as a rule. We say good and bad. But it's actually good and evil. In the Bible, Evil is the same word as bad. They're interchangeable. It's the same word, I should say. All right. And what's an angel? An angel, the fifth footnote is, dispatched as a deputy. It's something that is dispatched as a deputy. That's a representative, a messenger, an ambassador, an ambassador, one who speaks for you. That's an ambassador, okay? We, so we have here good angels and we have bad angels. We have good angels who speak for God. They're messengers for God. And we have bad angels who speak for Satan. They're messengers of Satan. The Bible says Satan's a god in this world. Guess what? He's doing a lot of talking. But the Bible also says you're no longer of this world. You who are saved and born again have come out of this world. And you're going to come out thoroughly uh, soon. When you, when you pass on, when you die, you'll receive the full mind of Christ when you die. 
it isn't, it, it, we've always thought dying to be a, a terrible, natu horrible thing, but it's actually a maturation thing. It mature, it, that's maturity. When you receive full maturity, and actually you look at that, when the plants and, and animals and the seeds and the fruit receive full maturity, then they're picked or, or then they die, okay? Uh, they're, they're either cut down or they're, they're picked or something they're used, they die. You have, you're coming into your children now, you're coming up, you're learning into maturity. When you get fully mature, shh, you die. And then the good things start. It's not the bad things, it's the good things. Satan will have you think it's the bad things. <laughs> it's the good things. It's the good things. Come out of the man. And Jesus asked him, he said, what is thy name? And he answered and said, my name is Legion, for we are many. Legion. Legion is uh, a reference to a Roman legion of 6,000 men, plus or minus. Maybe a few more, a thousand more, maybe a few thousand less. Legion. We are legion for we are many. Now, I'm looking at it like this. If this is a picture of the ultimate unsaved fella, and he has 6,000 demons in him, fallen angels in him, then we're not all crazy and wild. Maybe you've only got one or 2,000 or 3,000 or 2,500 or 5,000 or 500 or whatever. I think, we, I think the 6,000 in that area would be a, a high number. Just to use it a number, but maybe God's just using a number too. Yeah, I'm just suggesting to you. But we are the wild man that we're talking about here. We're just not as wild as this guy, but wild is wild. He said, my name is, and what is thy name? And he answered and said, my name is Legion, for we are many. And he besought, he pleaded with Jesus much that he would send him not away, it would send him not away out of the country. Now there was near a, the mountain to mountains, a great herd of swine feeding. And all the devils besought him, pleaded with him, saying, send us into the swine. So the fallen angels had to come out of the man, because Jesus said, come out of him. And they, wanted, they had to go someplace, and they said, send us into the swine, okay? Why do the devils want to go into the swine? You see, the, now that we got into the thing last week and again about uh, split hoof and, and, and cloven hoof. Let me just, uh, okay. <laughs> Let's just leave it, you go on. And, and the, the devils besought him, pleaded with him, saying, Send us into the swine that we may enter into them. And forthwith Jesus gave them leave. And the unclean spirits went out and entered into the swine. And the herd ran violently down a steep place into the sea. There were about 2,000. And they were choked in the sea. That's kind of the whole picture, okay? Now, let's go to, uh, that was Mark 5. Luke has a, 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 another version of the same thing. Let's look at Luke chapter 8, verse 30. This, we'll talk about this for a minute. And Jesus asked him, saying, What is thy name? And he said, Legion, because many devils were entered into them, into him. Okay, now let's look at the next thing. Is, uh, is titled, Le uh, Legion equals many unclean thoughts. Let's look at the explanation of, of um, uh, exegesis of uh, Luke chapter 8, verse 30. And Jesus asked him, Who did he ask? He's uh, talking to the wild man. He asked the wild man of Gad, Okay, a tribe that had refused to settle in the promised land. They had refused to settle in the promised land, but instead they chose to settle in the wilderness of the world. When, they, when, when Joshua was dividing up the land, okay, to, to the 12 tribes, the people of Gad didn't want to go into the, live in the promised land. They wanted to live next to it because they thought it was better for the cattle or whatever. Okay. So they turned down, they refused to live in the promised land. Think about that now. The promised land symbolizes heaven. That's a symbol of heaven. The people of Gad refused to live in heaven in symbolic terms, okay? So they were kind of like something wrong with these people in the first place, okay? All right? And they, 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 they this is the same thing as what happened to Lot. Lot was a, 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 a righteous man, the Bible says. He was a he was a, a, a saved born, a, a saved imputed for righteousness man. But Lot, when he had a choice, 
chose to live in Sodom. Sodom was a wicked, wicked place. Well, so they finally got all destroyed in the Bible because of the wickedness of Sodom. But Lot, who was a wealthy man, chose to, and a saved man, chose to live in Sodom. We got some people, a lot of people actually, a whole bunch of people who are saved and born again, who prefer the world to uh, the kingdom of heaven. You're sitting in the kingdom of heaven now. This is a type and shadow of the kingdom of heaven, in, in the sense of the word. Okay? We got a whole bunch of people out, out there who got all kinds of, uh, of, of to do, and some are not so wealthy, and whatever, but they refuse to go to church. They refuse to live and spend any time at all in the kingdom of heaven on earth. Well, what's the deal with those people? Well, some of those people are saved. Most of them are not saved, of course. But some of them are saved. But they're like Lot, who was saved, but he still chose to live in. Well, as it turns out, the people of Gad, and particularly the people of Succoth, who lived, it was a, a, a city of Gad, got, <laughs> had to go through the Great Tribulation. No, they, they were, they were uh, how do I say, trained up with, the, with thorns and briars of the wilderness. That's where this guy was living, with these people who, who were Jews, believing Jews, in essence, saved, but not wanting to live in a safe place. They, lived, they, they liked the, the, the world better. The, the wine, women, and song of the world better. I used to be wine, women, and song. I came out of that place. Okay? Wine, women, and song. And I'm living in God's world, on his kingdom of heaven here on this earth, which is not perfect by any means, but it's a certain whole bunch better than living out in the world. Anyway, and Jesus asked uh, the wild man, saying, what is thy name? And he said, Legion. And that refers to a Roman legion of about 6,000 soldiers. Because, why did he say that? Because many devils were entered into him. Many devils, parenthetically, is an indefinite but very great number of devils. That is, many fallen angels, demons, unclean spirits. Many unclean thoughts were entered into him. Now, that's the, the wild man we're talking about. Now, here, now we're going to read Mark chapter 5, verses 12 through 13. In the bold face, that's right from the uh, Bible. And all the devils besought him, this is another version, all the devils besought him, saying, Send us into the swine that we may enter into them. And forthwith Jesus gave them leave, and the unclean spirits went out and entered into the swine, and the herd ran violently down a steep place into the sea. They were about 2,000 and were choked in the sea. Here's an explanation of those verses. Devils are deceiving thoughts derived from Satan. They lie to us. Devils are deceiving thoughts derived from Satan. They lie to us. Okay, the explanation. And all, and all, the, uh, and all the devils, that's the fallen angels, demons, unclean spirits, unclean thoughts, pleaded with Jesus, saying, send us into the swine. Swine are hogs and pigs. Now, here, I'll explain it again. The hogs and pigs are a metaphor of unsaved men who are cloven-footed. Cloven-footed means split hooves. Split hooves. I did this last week and I did it poorly. I'll do it again, probably poorly again. That's a hoof. Here's, it's split here. Not all the way, but halfway up, okay? All right. That's a hoof. And that's a, uh, a, a pig. And that's a hoof of a horse, which is not cloven footed. Okay. The Bible has a thing about clean and unclean animals. And a, an un, a and animals that, that, uh, that uh, uh, have a split hoof and choose the cud are clean and, and edible. And animals that, are, that are, are anything, what are those two things, are not edible. Splitting the hoof means it. 
Now let me first go to the cud. See, cause pigs don't have to chew the cud. That's why they're unclean. They split the hoof, but they don't chew the cud. The cud is, is something that, that is a food that an animal eats and then swallows, and an animal has usually two to four stomachs in there, and then it, 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 it swirls around the stomach for a while, and then the animal brings it back up and chews it some more. That's symbolic of meditating, thinking things over. See, they, they took the food in, and they swallowed it, and it went through stomach, and now they're bringing it back up, and they're thinking it over again. Okay, that's chewing the cud. God says that's part of a clean animal. The other part of a clean animal is if they have split hooves. And split hoof is an indication of they're living in two worlds. They're living in uh, earth and they're living in heaven. One for each. And they're trying to live in two worlds, okay? Now the thing with pigs is they have split hooves. They're trying to live in two worlds, but they don't chew the cud. Ah, what's that mean? That means many people are trying to live in two worlds. They're coming to church, they're praising God, that's two hooves, and then they go back to the world again, that's, two, that's split hoof, but they don't chew the cud. They don't think over what God said. Chew the cud, they don't meditate. They don't, think, they don't take these, these things home and then look them over again. See, that's what she does. She goes home and she meditates about them and thinks, thinks, over, thinks them over. That's chewing, the, that's chewing the cud when you think things over. See, if you thought things over, if you really, really thought things over, if everybody out in the world really thought things over, everybody would be saved. <laughs> who, who wouldn't be saved? Hey, you got a choice. You go to hell, get burned up forever and ever and ever and ever and ever. It's going to burn. You're a worm inside the fire all the time in a burning lake of fire. That doesn't, that doesn't sound that cool to me, okay? Or you can go to heaven and be happy and rejoice and be happy and merry for all eternity. What's the deal? What's the deal? What's so hard about that? Well, people don't think that over, see? Hey, oh, I'll just do what I want to do still. I'll just, uh, uh, uh. All right, well, good luck. Good luck with that. But that's not what God said. And who created you? God created you, and he said, this is what the deal is all about. You're either going to be one of the, <laughs> go to heaven and be happy for all eternity, holy and happy and do my God's work for all eternity, or for all eternity, you're going to go into a burning lake of fire and burn when, you're, when your body won't burn up, it just burns all the time, forever and ever and ever. Some, some, well, what? What, is it, what, what? what kind of a choice is that? What kind, of, what kind of a person says, well, I don't care, I'm going to just, Go into that lake of fire then, I guess that's true. <laughs> you see how, how really not, uh, very foolish that is? Well, I still want to do what, I, what I'm doing, okay? God, you know what God said about that? You can still do that. Some of it. And go to heaven. I was smoking cigarettes. I'm not going to ask you here how many people smoke, still smoke cigarettes. But guess what? You can still go to heaven, you're smoking cigarettes. Well, how you can you do that? It's a sin, because it's defiling your body, the body's the temple, the Holy Spirit, so on and so on. God understands that we're not perfect. God understands that we're not perfect. Okay? But he wants us to become as perfect as it is possible for us to become. But when you get to heaven, do you think you're going to be smoking cigarettes? <laughs> I don't think so. God understands that we're humans and we're flesh. God understands that we have weaknesses. God understands that we can't overcome all our weaknesses or we'd be perfect if we could overcome them all. We'd be Jesus Christ. We're not Jesus Christ. We can't overcome all our weaknesses. But he wants us to, to look at what the weaknesses we have and try to overcome them as best we can and other things that we will overcome. God understands. So he goes on with this now then. All of this, uh, all, I was reading that Mark chapter 5, verse 12, 13, of the explanation. And all the devils 
uh, came to him saying, uh, pleaded with him saying, well, send us into the swine, the pigs, that we may enter into them. And forthwith, that's immediately, Jesus gave them leave. And look at that. You see, we don't think about things a lot. Forthwith means immediately or real, real soon. But we're looking at now to mean for, uh, immediately. How come? Why did Jesus immediately give them permission to enter into the swine? Why is it important for us to be here immediately? It shows that Jesus didn't want those swine, those fallen, those, those fallen uh, angels, the, uh, those demons inside you any longer than he had to leave them be there. But when he cast them out and they had to go somewhere, he wanted them immediately to be gone. Not, well, let me think about, Jesus didn't say, well, let me think about that. Let me see, I'll say, yeah, well, uh, I guess you can go into the, ain't to do that. Immediately. Because they're harming you. They're harming you. And the unclean thoughts went out and entered into the swine. And the herd ran violently down a steep place into the sea. They were about 2,000 and were choked in the sea. Now we're not going to finish this, but I'm going to do just a little bit more here. Devils are lying spirits. That's the subtopic here. Devils are lying spirits. Look at John chapter 8, verse 30 through 32. And as he, that Jesus spake these words, many believed on him. Then said Jesus to those Jews which believed on him, If ye continue in my word, then ye are my disciples indeed, and ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall, set, shall make you free. Now wait a minute. We've heard that before, haven't we? The truth shall And the truth shall make you free. Free of what? What free? Free? What? Free what? Free of the fallen angels, the demons, the unclean thoughts that are living in your mind. The truth, Jesus Christ said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. The truth shall make you free of the, your afflictions, of your, of your, I'm sure not, your addictions, of the unclean spirits of the fallen angels and the demons that are living in your mind. The truth shall make you free. Who is the truth? His name is Jesus Christ. How do we know that? Turn the page over. John 14, 6. Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. And the truth shall set, make you free. And the truth shall make you free of all the addictions, all the problems that you have. I have still unclean, uh, fallen angels living inside of me. Still, I'm 20 some years saved. I still got that. But I'm getting better all the time. I'm getting stronger all the time. And so are you. If you're saved and born again, if you're talking to God, if you're talking to God, the truth, Jesus Christ shall make you free. It's Jesus. What did the, what did the, the, the wild man do when he saw Jesus? He ran to him. He knew the truth, Jesus going to make him free. And what did Jesus do? He freed him. He saved him. This is a really, really important story. That's why I keep going back to it. For This is my sixth week. 
really important. The truth shall make you free. You got those problems? Some of you are smoking cigarettes, some of you are doing heroin, some of you are doing crack, some of you are doing pills, you're doing this, meth, everything, all kind of stuff, drugs and things going up. Uh, some of you are swearing all the time, you're swearing that this thing, uh, taking God's name in vain. Some of you are doing this thing, that thing, you're still stealing, you're whatever. <coughs> those are all <coughs> fallen angels inside you <coughs> that are controlling you. <coughs> that are controlling your thoughts, because they are your thoughts and your mind. And Jesus, as the Bible says, God will make a way to escape. That's Jesus Christ. And Jesus will make you free. I couldn't have gotten rid of some, the, those, the, some the things that I had going on in my head. I, could, I tried, couldn't get rid of them. Jesus did, though. When I was willing, oh, that's the other thing. Oh, that's an important thing. <clears throat> of course, there is a condition where the truth will not make you free. It's called willingness. What that means is this. I want to quit smoking, I want to quit smoking, I want to quit smoking. Oh, please, oh, I want to quit smoking, I want to quit smoking. But I wasn't willing to quit smoking. I wasn't really willing in my heart, way down deep. I just said I wanted to quit smoking. I thought I meant I wanted to quit smoking. But I really didn't mean I wanted to quit smoking. I wanted to quit smoking because I kept on smoking. I was not willing to allow Jesus Christ to get rid of that for me. <clears throat> I'll tell you a story. Most of you know this already. I used to have a construction company here in Florida. I had lots and lots of crews, crews, C-R-E-W-S, people, three, four, five man crews working for me. A lot of crews. I used to go to lunch with uh, a lot of them. <clears throat> you know how construction guys talk, don't you? They don't talk a regular English language like I do. They swear. How, many, how often do they swear? At least one, I was swearing, I shouldn't say them, I was swearing at least one swear word, at least one swear their word in a, a sentence, and usually two. I was communicating to them in their language, but it was my language too. And they were, oh, this thing, we had to rattle this, and this, oh, and I, well, we have to rattle back, and rattle, rattle, rattle. I was communicating in their language, but that was my language too. <clears throat> I was swearing at least once, sometimes, often, twice, uh, uh, in, in one single sentence. I got saved, I got born again, and I took word about my business, and about two weeks after I got saved, I got born again. I was having lunch with some of my guys, I think, or, or something like that, and I said, wait a minute, I'm not swearing anymore. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not swearing anymore. Well, that's a big deal for a guy who swears well, at least once, sometimes twice, in every single sentence that he ever utters out of his mouth. That's a big deal. The guy was right into the construction end of it. And I wasn't swearing anymore. How come? See, Jesus took that away from me because I was willing to let it go. I was willing to let it go. You've got to be willing to let it go. Jesus, God will never overpower you in anything that you're doing. Not ever. Even if you're going to go kill somebody, he won't overpower you. He won't make you stop and do that. I'll give me a true example now. You've got to be willing. Yes, Jesus can get rid of all those problems that you have inside you. All those fallen angels, all those demons, all those unclean thoughts. But you've got to be willing to let them go. Because otherwise, the problem is, see... We get to liken them. We get to liken them. I still like some of the things I used to do, actually, okay, but I don't do them anymore, okay? But we get to liken these things. And so we think we know we shouldn't be doing them, and we want to get rid of them, but we really don't want to get rid of them. We're just thinking we do, or acting like we do, but we don't. Your willingness is what makes 
Your willingness is what makes this sentence valid. Your willingness, with your willingness, the truth shall, shall make you free. With your will, without your willingness, it will never make you free. You've got to be willing to let it go. Really, really willing. Not just kidding yourself, willing. Really, really willing to let it go. God will take care of it. If you're saved and born again. If you're not saved and born again, you got a real problem. Because <laughs> you've got some demons, some devils inside of you, and there ain't no way to get rid of them. Because you can't, you do not have the power to overpower a fallen angel. An angel's got angel, angel power. You just don't have that power. If, particularly if you're not saved and born again. You don't even have the power if you are saved and born again. That's why we got to have Jesus do it for us. Praise God. Jesus Christ said in John 3, 3, he said, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. You know, you can't be born again unless you're willing to be born again. Did you know that? You can't be born again. Unless you're willing. And if you're not willing, you can say, the, say, uh, say those words, uh, the prayer, a thousand times, nothing happens. Because you're just saying words. Where if you're willing <clears throat> to open up a little space in your heart, if you're willing to allow Jesus Christ to come into your, because he won't overpower you. If you're willing to allow, see, if he overpowered you, he'd be like raping you. He wants to come into you. A rapist overpowers a person because they want to go into them and, and rape them. Jesus Christ, if, if he just, well, I got the power. I'll, you, he just overraped you. He, he's not going to rape you. Jesus wants to be willingly invited. Love. The beginning of love. He wants you to be willing. He wants to be willingly invited into your into your heart. That's willingness. Otherwise, it's rape. Think about it like that. So, Jesus Christ said in John three three, "Except a man be born again, except a man be born again." Except a man be born again. <clears throat> what does that mean? Well, some of us uh, are Catholics, and when we were kids, mom and dad took us to the priest when we were goo goo, 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 goo whatever kind of a thing. And, and the priest baptized us and said, We're going to heaven. <laughs> well, that's not what Jesus said. <laughs> See, he didn't say that because if that would have been true, you know what this would, what the verse in John three would be? Except a man be baptized, he cannot see the kingdom of God. He didn't say that. He said you got to be born again. That's a different deal. When you got tabbed when you were a Catholic kid, that didn't do nothing for you. It made the priest happy because he made a couple of bucks on it. It made mom and dad happy because they thought they, they'd taken care of your kid forever and ever and ever. Forget that. Never happened. Was a kid willing? Kid was willingness in the kid. It was, eh, eh, eh. no willingness there. But Jesus said, except the man be born again. He didn't say, except the man be black or pink or purple or polka dotted. He didn't say he'd be two footed, one footed, or three footed. He said, he didn't say be Baptist and Protestant, Catholic, Muslim, uh, uh, Shinto. He didn't say anything. He said, you got to be born again. Well, what does that mean, being born again? Romans 10, 9, the Apostle Paul explained it like this. Here's how you get to be born again. That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus. Notice that? Confess with thy mouth means you've got to say something. 
first you've got to say words, okay? If thou shalt confess, and confess means that you realize that you've broken God's laws and are asking for forgiveness, okay? If thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus. Lord means supreme in authority. Kurios in the Greek is supreme in authority. What you're really doing is you're asking Jesus Christ. You're inviting Jesus Christ to come into your heart and be the Lord of your life, to lead you and guide you. How many people know how to get to heaven? I don't know how to get to heaven. No, you don't know how to get to heaven. you got to follow Jesus. I don't know how to, I can't go to heaven. Where is it? i got to follow Jesus. you got to follow Jesus. you got to follow Jesus. you got to follow Jesus to get to heaven. Otherwise, where do you think you're going? <laughs> you have no idea. You're wandering around. But if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, that means to be supreme in authority in your life, and, uh, Romans 10, 9, there's a bit more than that, and if thou shalt if to believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. If you're willing to believe, willingness, now again, if you're willing to believe that Jesus Christ died on this cross and paid the penalty for all your sins, then, if you're willing to believe, you can do the first part of this verse, which is, if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus. You can say a little prayer with me. I'll say it first, and you can say it with me. Okay? And you can receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. But you've got to be willing to believe that he died on the cross and paid the penalty for all your sins. Now, if you're not... Now, how much... How much... How much... Uh, well, I believe that. Yeah, well, I mean, I'm... I, you can't be like that. You don't have, <laughs> have the faith to believe like that. But all God's asking for is a little bit of your heart. Just a little bit, a little bit, a little bit of space in your heart. Because he wants to plant a seed there. And the seed is Jesus Christ in your heart. He wants to plant Jesus Christ in your heart. And what will happen is, when you read the word of God, which is the, the, the water of the word, the word of God is water. It's the Holy Spirit, it's water. You're watering that seed and it will grow and expand in your heart. Like it's done in mine. It'll grow and expand. It'll be a miracle. It'll be a wonderful thing. I'm going to tell you, it's the most wonderful thing that ever happened to me. And I had it all. I had wine, women, and song. I had everything that the world says that you're supposed to have. Uh, and uh, didn't mean squat. But now, I'm a happy guy. Because I know where I'm going. And I know why I'm going there. Praise God. Amen. So now I'm going to ask you this. Anybody here today like to receive Jesus Christ in their heart for the first time? Okay. Please raise your hand and I'll say a prayer with you. Anyone at all, raise your hand. Brett, you can sit back. You're going to go to heaven. Don't worry about it. <laughs> I've got a brand new body. You sit right back down, Brett. Uh, anybody here like to receive Jesus Christ for the first time? Anybody here willing to receive Jesus Christ? as our Lord and Savior. Well, if you're, if you're not, if, if, if no one has raised their hand, okay, I'm also addressing an internet congregation here. This is going out to every country in the world right now as well, okay? But you are, you're, you're a repeat like Brett, okay? And that's fine. This man raises his hand all the time. He wants, and Brett does the same thing. They do it every time because they just want to make sure. So this, I got it, I got it. God's giving you assurance. You're saved. You're born again. You're saved. You're born again. You guys are going to heaven. You don't have to raise your hand ever again in your entire life. You're still going to go to heaven. But if you want to raise your hand, that's up to you. Okay? All right. Okay. So we have a, I forgot, no, we have an internet congregation that we're going to ask as well if they can raise their hand. I'm speaking out, I'm addressing them. If you want to receive Jesus as your Lord and Savior, raise your hand wherever you are, in, in your, your house, your apartment, or wherever you are, raise your hand. I know it sounds ludicrous. I can't see that. I'm not there. But God's there. God's watching. You see, God's here. The Bible says that the holy angels are all around us. We got holy angels all around. We got God around us. And Jesus Christ is here. He's in you and you and you, 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 you. He's in us. And he's growing. 
he's expanding inside of us. We're beginning to think like he thinks. The more we take in of his word, the more we think like him. Praise God. We're being domesticated. Remember the wild animals we talked about when we first started? That we all are? We're being domesticated. I'm being domesticated. I used to be a wild man. I wasn't quite as bad as this guy running around naked and everything, but you know, I could have come close to it sometimes. But uh, uh, <laughs> I, was, I was a wild man. And I'm, I'm maybe still a wild man to a certain degree. Certainly I am, but I'm controlling it now because God's given me what control. He's given me temperance. That's the, the, the last and ninth gift of the Holy Spirit, or the fruit of the Spirit, I should say, is temperance. Temperance means self-control. I have self-control. Now, I don't always have self-control. I'm not perfect. Sometimes uh, then I go ahead and do something I shouldn't do, but I've got self-control for the most part. And I'm getting stronger and stronger in it. It's not what you are now, it's you're becoming, always we're becoming. Like, like you came here this week for, for uh, well, this is, let's talk about last week. Right now, because you heard God's word today, everyone who heard God's word today, that's strength and power. That's health and happiness, the Bible says. All right? You're stronger now than you were last week. And, 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 and you're stronger, you're getting stronger every time you hear God's word. Every time you come in church, you're getting stronger and stronger. Amen. Praise God. So anybody, we're going to say this prayer then for those people in the internet congregation. And I know that there's people here who, who want, talking to God is a wonderful thing. It changes everything because God is love. When you're, when you're praying, click, immediately, God's watching us all now. He knows all about all of us. But when you pray, Bang, click. You say, Father God, and bingo, God's focused on you. But he's also focused on you and focused on you. So he's not in general now, it's focused. When you pray, God's focused on you. What is God? God is love. So that means that while I'm there praying up to God, what's he doing back down to me? He's, down, he's loving me. You see? Just like the wild animals. Or, or when I, remember, I, I'm the wild animal, and God's the domesticator, the one who domesticates. I'm, 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 I'm in, praying, praying to him. It's like the, like the, the horse is coming to me. The horse is coming to me. I'm the horse now around God. God, thank you, Lord. Amen. Amen. It's love. It's all love. So if you'd like to say this prayer with me, and it's for you, it's a repeat, and we're like a bunch of holy angels just escorting these people to heaven. You can do that. Please stand if you'd like to say this prayer with me. Good. All right. Father God. Father God. And, wait a minute. Listen. The Bible says the angels of God rejoice over one sinner that repents, okay? Yeah. We're talking to God. Use your voice. Yeah. Father God, Father God. I, confess I'm a I confess I'm a sinner. Please forgive me. Please forgive me. I, believe I believe that Jesus Christ, that Jesus Christ died, on the cross died on the cross and paid the penalty, paid the penalty. for all my sins and was raised again. Again. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Father God. Father God. Please send your son. Please send your son. Your seed. Your, seed. your fire. Your, fire. Your, love. your love. Into my heart. Into my heart. To, be the Lord. to be the Lord. And Savior. And Savior. Of, my of my life. Thank you, Father God. Thank you, Father God. Amen. 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 Hallelujah. Please be seated. Please be seated. Please be seated. Jim. Tim's going to come around with a tithes and offerings. Uh, I, I do this every time. This is the blessing. Take the blessing home with you. Look it over, okay? I didn't get anywhere hardly into it at all, but look over the blessing, all right? So you've already been blessed because you got God's word. You heard God's word. You've already been blessed. Now God wants you to give you another blessing. This is called the tithe, okay? And God said, 
and return to me. Uh, he didn't say give to me, he said return to me. The idea is he gave you everything that you have. He's asking for you to return 10% of your increase for the week or the month or whatever the case might be. And he said if you do that, if you return to him the increase, he will open the windows of heaven. He said this. He will open the windows of heaven above you. God said that. In the Bible. Well, on the, that's right, in the Bible. That's right. He will open the windows of heaven above you so you cannot contain all the blessings that will flow down upon you. That many blessings. Okay, now, what's one blessing from God worth? Wow. Who could, who could put, who couldn't even put a price on that when you think about it? But one blessing from God worth. He said, all the blessings... You can't contain all the blessings that God will fall down upon you. They'll fall down upon you, off onto you, onto other people around you. The blessings. That's if you obey him. We're looking for obedience here. Of course, if you don't obey him, that's a different ball game now. So this is actually a self-test as well. God knows your heart. He knows what, whether you, you, how you esteem him, how, what you think of God in terms uh, he, he knows that you love him or if you don't love him or, and how much. He knows that, but you don't know. But he says, here's a test for you so you can find out yourself how much you love me. Will you obey me? I'm asking you to give, the Bible says, the love of money is the root of all evil. I'm asking you to give something that you perhaps love and sacrifice that to me. In other words, give it part of that to me, putting that lower than God. Now, if you insist on keeping your money, then you're putting the money higher than what God wants, than what God is. So you're worshiping, you can't worship uh, God and mammon, the Bible says. Mammon is wealth. Can't worship wealth. If you made a dollar this week profit on something, 10 cents of it, the first 10 cents goes to God. If you made $10, then $10, or then $1 goes to God, 10%. Now, let's say you've got uh, two kids, a baby, and a, a baby needs uh, diapers and, and uh, some pavel farm, and you only made ten dollars this week. I so, well, I'm going to buy stuff, from diapers, and things for my shop. No, you don't. No, you don't do that. You give a dollar to God. You made ten dollars. You take a dollar off the top and give it to God, and then you take care of your kids. And what's God say? He said, "Cast your cares upon me, for I care for you." He says, I will take care of your problems if you obey me. Now, if you don't obey me, you don't get nothing. You get the same benefits as that the, the, the unsaved people get in all, all, all the world. But if you obey me, he'll take care of you. He'll take care of your kids. He'll take care of you. I, <laughs> I did that years ago. Man, it worked for me. God's taking care of He's providing for all my needs. Everything he's providing. And on top of it, giving me an immeasurable amount of happiness and joy. An immeasurable amount of happiness and joy. Do you want to be happy? Or do you want to be conflicted and sad and miserable all your life? It's up to you. If you're, and I'm talking to people who are, for a lot of you are, miserable and unhappy and sad and... and just not get it. things aren't working right. How come? Well, what did the wild man do when he had the problem? He ran to God. That's the way out. That's the way out of your problems. Run into God. That's the way out. Praise God. Father God, in the name of Jesus Christ, we thank you for these tithes and offerings. We thank you for this message. We ask that you continue to, to bless us. I ask that you bless this entire congregation, every person in it, Lord, bless them and help them come closer to you. Help them to understand your love and their ability to return that love. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, amen. amen. One, one more thing before we go. Yes, we're gonna, we're gonna um, tie my strap here. We're gonna bless the food. Kurt, please you step forward, please. Bless the food for us. Yes, uh, thank you, Laura, for this beautiful day. 
thank you for your word through uh, Reverend Lionel. Please uh, thank you for, this, for your food we're about to receive. And may God bless all of you, and God bless America. Amen. Amen. God bless America. God bless America. Thank you. Hallelujah.